Merci, Robert. Uh, bienvenue tout le monde. Thank you very much, uh, Rob. I'm pleased to be with you today. Uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, what I intend to do today is fairly straightforward. I'll open up with a short, brief opening comment. Then I'll ask and turn the three panelists to speak after introducing them. And then, then at that point, we'll open up to, uh, the session to discussions and to questions. So if you have any questions or comments, as, as has already been said, please feel free to jot them down. Don't forget them so that we can come back to you and have a discussion with you so that this becomes an interactive session. So as you know, this is the third heritage summit that the eight provincial heritage agencies have organized. We have aimed to foster collaboration, to share, share innovation, innovative ideas, and to identify opportunities and challenges. That has allowed us to get to know each other and to compare notes. One important result of our increasing collaboration has been a heightened awareness of the precarious state of Manitoba's heritage. In particular, the role of the Department of Sport, Culture and Heritage has weakened substantially while its support of the heritage sector has stagnated. We have learned in working together that provincial support of the PHAs has not increased in at least 20 years. That's 2020 years. Since a dollar in 2002 would now have the purchasing power of 67 cents at most, this decline in real support is creating increasing pressure on all heritage agencies. We first raised this issue with the Ministry of Sport, Culture and Heritage in a letter on April 4th of this year, and in a subsequent virtual meeting with them. We have emphasized that the PHAs require sustainable funding that will help maintain our capacity to provide our valuable services and operations. We have urged the department to adopt a long-term approach to funding the PHAs to ensure their resiliency and sustainability. We have stressed that stable and predictable funding would allow them to better serve Manitobans, to fulfill their mandates, to engage in long-term planning, and to support the department in achieving its own stated mission. In planning today's summit, we of course have invited the minister to join us first on June 15th and again on July 28th. Yesterday afternoon, the minister declined our invitation, stating that due to ministerial commitments, he, has not, he was not available to attend and asked his assistant to send his sincerest regrets and apologies. So I am sending those regrets and apologies to you on his behalf. I share this brief history with you to set the stage for our first panel discussion titled The State of Heritage in Manitoba, A Call to Action. To help guide our deliberations, we have assembled a panel of representatives of three provincial heritage agencies. I would first like to call upon Thomas McLeod, the Executive Director of the Association of Manitoba Museums. Is Thomas with us? I don't see his name up on the list here. If he's not, I'll go directly to our second panelist, Alicia Budin. She's the current president of the Manitoba Archaeological Society. She has a master's degree in archaeology and has worked in Canada, the UK, and Croatia. She also teaches the Archaeological Field School and Anthropology courses at Brandon University. She was, has lately been focusing her energies on excavating for the Pearson Wildlife Management Area Archaeological Project with the Brandon, with Brandon University, connecting the MAS with Indigenous communities. Alicia, I see you're with us. Welcome, and it's over to you. Thank you, Michelle. Uh, I'm going to share my screen. I have a small presentation ready so you people can watch that, not my face. Just going to confirm everyone can see uh, just my PowerPoint. Can people see my PowerPoint? I know I can, Alicia. Go ahead. Okay. Okay, so uh, Tanchi, good morning. Thank you for coming today, everyone. Uh, as Michelle said, my name is Alicia Gooden. I am a professional archaeologist. I've been volunteering and working in the Manitoba heritage sector since 2010. Uh, and I've conducted archaeological work in Canada, England, and Croatia. 
I will skip my little career history that Michelle uh, ran down and go straight to saying I began volunteering with the MAS, the Manitoba Archaeological Society, in 2019 and have been president since 2021. Uh, over the past few years, thanks to my involvement with the MAS, I've become acutely aware of how bereft Manitoba's heritage sector is. And when I say uh, bereft, let me be clear, we have plenty of culture, history, and heritage to share with the world. People are interested in what we do. They want to see the results of our work and participate when possible. What we lack is reliable support through government funding. The MAS's history and current situation speaks volumes to the dire position many of the PHAs face, which is why today I will be sharing a brief uh, history of the MAS and our story of triumph in the face of financial decline. Uh, before, I for, uh, <clears throat> before I begin, I would like to read the MAS's land acknowledgement. The Manitoba Archaeological Society acknowledges that the province of Manitoba is situated on Treaty 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 9 territories of the Anishinaabeg, Anishinaabeg, Denisilin, and Nehetuik, and on ancestral lands of the Odawa, Dakota Oyate, and Yanktonai Nakoda or Assiniboine people. We also acknowledge that Northern Manitoba includes territories that were and are the ancestral lands of Inuit people, that part of Manitoba is located on the homeland of the Red River Metis, and that the territory now comprising Manitoba as a whole was variously inhabited solely by ancestral indigenous peoples for over 500 generations. The MAS respects the treaties that were made on the lands that now comprise the province of Manitoba and we acknowledge the harms and mistakes of the past occasion by European settlement. We appreciate the opportunity to live and learn on these traditional lands and we dedicate ourselves to move forward in partnership with indigenous peoples and all peoples in a spirit of goodwill and reconciliation. Uh, a brief history. In August of 1961, about 20 individuals dedicated to the archaeology of Manitoba established the Archaeological Society of Manitoba, which eventually became known as the Manitoba Archaeological Society. The society's purpose was ultimately to identify and protect archaeological sites. 61 years later, professional and amateur archaeologists from all walks of life continue to dedicate themselves to promote the preservation, investigation, and publication of archaeological information, to organize professionals, amateurs, and the public interested in Manitoba archaeology, to foster the study and teaching of archaeology through the province, to enlist the aid of all citizens in reporting, preserving, and recording archaeological sites, and to raise money through donations, grants, contracts, and other fundraising efforts to promote the endeavors of the society. The first major project undertaken by the MAS was in the 1962-63 season, during which we worked with the provincial government on an archaeological salvage program for the Greater Winnipeg Floodway Project. At the time, the Floodway Channel was the second largest earth-moving project in the world, and the MAS was there. We helped ensure the safety of the heritage items affected by this immense undertaking. <clears throat> by 1964, the annual MAS membership fee was $3, for which a member received the quarterly newsletter and an invitation to participate in summer outdoor activities. Over the decades, the MAS has partnered with academic, government, and cultural resource management groups to work on a huge number of sites all over the province. In 1991, to address the growing need to disseminate all the data being gathered by the MAS, the first Manitoba Archaeological Journal was published. Uh, the MAJ is, to this date, the only Alicia? scholarly journal. Yes? Sorry, can I get you to make your slides fill the whole screen? We're only pro pro presently seeing just a fraction of them. Hmm. Sorry. You know what? I can't do that right now because of the way I have my notes set up. Thank you. I don't know if any of that helps. The PowerPoint's not that important. <laughs> um, okay, back to my, my presentation. Sorry about that. So nowadays, membership fees range from $30 to $60 per year, for which a member receives a copy of the MHA, the biannual MAS newsletter, access to our social media activities, premier invitations to annual conference, public archeology span days, plenty of other events, and the ability to shape the society itself during our members only uh, annual general meeting. 
Now here's where the financial woes begin. Uh, our struggles began during the late 1990s, less than a decade after we published the first MAJ. This was a time when government downsizing led to increased pressure on heritage groups to take over duties previously paid for and provided by provincial and or federal governments. The MAS was able to stay active mainly thanks to a single retired and tenacious volunteer, Peter Priest. Peter kept the MAS running almost single-handedly for years, beginning in 1998. Uh, the MAS did have a paid office manager working alongside Peter for a few years in the early 2000s, but due to changes from our main funding body, the provincial government, we could no longer use grant money uh, for operations. So we couldn't use it to pay the bills uh, or rent or pay the office manager anymore. So in 2007, our office manager left because we could no longer pay him. And Peter once again stepped up to take over all office management duties on a volunteer basis. Uh, in 2011, 2012, all the PHAs were hit with new requirements, including us. Our provincial funding came with a new proviso, the obligation to work collaboratively with the other provincial heritage agencies on at least one event per year. Uh, and while this new requirement led to the birth of the Heritage Summit and the continued collective advocation for the PHAs, it is another large demand on our time and budget. Uh, in 2016, the MAS was hit with the hard news that our office would no longer be available to us. We could not afford a new space. So without an office to work from, our MVP volunteer Peter finally decided to retire. And since that day, the MAS phone number goes directly to voicemail. There's no phone in existence. There's no office to actually sit in and answer the phone. All of our equipment, paperwork, artifacts, maps, books, everything had to be put into a rented storage locker. Last year, the MAS celebrated its 60th anniversary. We decided that the thousands of dollars in storage rental fees we had been paying since losing our office were necessary elsewhere. So all of our equipment was moved into the executive and council's personal office, uh, office spaces. Uh, however, by sacrificing our rentage store at unit last year, the MAS was able to establish three annual $500 scholarships for archaeology students in Manitoba. The purpose of the scholarships is to help archaeology students attain their academic goals, which will hopefully lead to the development and retention of professional archaeologists within the province. Uh, since the government's not doing much to keep them here, we're trying to do what we can. Uh, now, although the MAS is run entirely by volunteers with full-time careers and education commitments, we have managed to keep going. We are currently blessed with a fantastic group of dedicated individuals on our executive and council. And for the past few years, the society has focused our efforts on increasing youth and indigenous involvement in the province's archeological scene. This work has led to a small increase in general membership we have student representatives for the first time in ages, and we've almost doubled our exec and council volunteers since 2019. We also managed to participate in a variety of outreach events so far this year, uh, like career fair, school presentations, displays, assessing and curating museum collections, site inspections, and dozens of artifact identifications through email and social media. Um, I'm gonna take this opportunity to highlight three of these events, um, but it's worth pointing out that a lot of these tasks, particularly site inspections and artifact identification, museum assessment, used to be done by paid civil servants until funding to those government bodies was severely cut in the early late 90s to early 2000s. Uh, every year, the MAS, uh, and other PHAs are required by our funding body to hold an event celebrating Manitoba Day. So on May 14th and 15th this year, we had our first in-person Manitoba Day event in two years. You can see our exec and council members set up a booth in the Prairies Gallery at the Manitoba Museum where they engaged over 150 visitors with hands-on artifacts, photos of recent excavations, videos, pamphlets of archaeological sites. Uh, and again, just to point, just to get the point home, that is a required event by our funding body. 
Uh, the Pearson Wildlife Management Area Archaeological Project is a joint Brandon University MAS multi-year excavation. Dr. Mary Mullaney of Brandon University is the principal investigator and MAS treasurer. She's been researching the Olson site in the presence of pre-contact Indigenous agriculture in the Pearson WMA since 2018. Uh, and now not only is this site changing the way we think about agriculture in the prairies, we also use it as a vehicle for mentorship and training of current and recently graduated archaeology students. The government doesn't provide any kind of training. We are the only group in the province providing archaeological mentorship and training outside of the field schools offered by Brandon University and the University of Manitoba. And I might point out that I'm the one, you know, Dr. Mary Mullaney and me are the ones running the BU field school. Uh, we also hold our public archaeology days, our biggest event of the year at this site. Hundreds of people of all ages and from all over Manitoba and Canada have come out to participate in the PWMA excavations. Uh, and this site has also helped foster connections with the nearest First Nation community, Chenapuakpa Dakota Nation. Uh, knowledge Keeper Greg Chatkana and his brother Chicago Dima of Chenpuakpa have provided guidance in offerings and ceremonies and have shared cultural knowledge with us to help interpret the site and its surrounding areas since 2019. And we've recently begun a new project with Dr. Mary Mulaney and Dr. Hamid Muman of the Geology Department at Brandon University and Chenpuakpa Dakota Nation, sanctioned by Chief Lola Thunderchild and her council. We are hoping to determine the composition and distribution of pipestone like rock, as well as its possible use by indigenous groups prior to and after European contact. Um, I can't say too much about this project right now, uh, but its research could lead to a much deeper understanding of the local Dakota population's cultural roots. And finally, my final highlight, the Winnipeg Indigenous Accord on June 28th, I was honored to represent the MAS at the fifth annual Winnipeg Indigenous Accord signing ceremony. The accord is a living document based on Canada's Truth and Reconciliation Commission's 94 calls to action, and it is meant to guide our shared commitment to the journey of reconciliation. The MAS's goals regarding the accord are to expand our established connections with Indigenous groups in order to increase their involvement with archaeology and the interpretation and preservation of Indigenous culture and to increase the amount of our early education engagement on archeology span and indigenous prehistory. So although the society is not an educational institute nor a business, we believe our efforts reflect the spirit of TRC calls to action points 10.3, 12, 62.1 and 92.1. Now that all being said, what are we worth? All this work we do every year, we provide around 1,700 man hours valued at over $195,000 in service to Manitoba archeology span and heritage every year. The PHA grant program provides the MAS with $11,200 annually. We get another about $11,000 from other heritage grants that we must also apply for every year. We get approximately $3,500 covered by MAS membership fees and around $1,000 in donations are received usually via goods in kind per year. This means that the Manitoba Archaeological Society is providing the province and its citizens with around $170,000 worth of free labor, training, unique experiences, and heritage content every year. And from what I've seen and heard and what I know, the other PHAs are fairly similar. Most of the MAS's outreach activities require travel all across the southern portion of the province and unfortunately we're only able to provide a few hundred dollars per year to volunteers traveling to and from events, museums, indigenous communities and archaeological sites because the bulk of our funding, our funding, the heritage grant, must go toward programming, running our conference and AGM, manual uh, Manitoba Day events, uh, special occasions such as the Manitoba 150 event from previous years. And of course, the printing and shipping costs of our journal and newsletters. And uh, fun fact, we are also unable to provide any financial assistance for the Heritage Summit. Hooray! <laughs> we came through the pandemic, the MAS and the other PHAs, we have made it through the pandemic stronger than before in manpower and the drive to provide stability in the heritage sector. What we lack is the financial support to deliver what the province expects and demands of us. 
The 11,200 we gratefully accept from the government each year was barely enough to keep the MAS running in 2012. It's now 10 years later in a period of record-breaking inflation, and we are still only receiving 11,200. That money no longer has the same buying power it had a decade ago, which means every year the inflation rate increases that our grants do not, we are actually losing funding. Um, I'd ask you to take a look at the table on your screen. This is a comparison of Manitoba and Saskatchewan PHA funding from 2020 and 2021. All of the Manitoba PHAs get only a fraction of what our closest neighbors receive from their government. Seven out of eight Manitoba PHAs get less than 20% of what their Saskatchewan counterpart gets each year, with one Manitoba PHA receiving about 52% of its Saskatchewan equivalent. The MAS gets 4% of the annual funding that the Saskatchewan Archaeological Society does. Why is that? Well, the Saskatchewan funding is tied to its lotteries program, so they know what they will get their funding year after year. We have to ask for the same amount every year. We are not allowed to ask for more, and we have to ask every year. Saskatchewan gets stability, whereas Manitoba doesn't. Manitoba groups have to waste so much time and energy begging for scraps every year. We can't predict future funding. We can't commit to large or long-term projects. Um, while archeology span is our passion, all of our executive and council have full-time jobs and or school outside of the MAS. Two of our executive have PhD days, four have master's degrees, two have bachelor's degrees. We have no paid staff, no physical office. We are barely able to meet current demands, let alone keep pace with future demands from not only our members, but also from the public, professionals, academics, cultural resource management, and of course, the provincial government itself. There is a ton of archeological work in Manitoba needing to be done, but we do not have enough professionals or cultural guides to get the work done before sites are destroyed by weather and climate, construction, agriculture, our people get educated here and then leave for greener pastures. We need paid jobs to keep people here. The PHAs are doing for free what used to be paid government work. And if the province would like to see the MAS and the other PHAs thrive or even continue to survive in some cases, we must receive more financial aid support from the PHA grant program. Grant amounts in the heritage sector have not kept pace with inflation rates or dollar value changes. We are realists. We understand that the government cannot make money appear where there is none. However, we also know that it is our responsibility to ensure that our needs are known and met. There is funding available for those who need it and ask for it. The MAS and the other seven PHAs are in need, have been in need. We are asking for it and have been asking for it. The PHAs cannot continue to struggle along with shoestring budgets when the funding is there. The province keeps reminding us that they just pumped 100 million into the arts, culture and sport and community fund, but where is that money? Why hasn't the province preemptively allocated a portion of it to their established PHAs? In June of this year, the MAS and the other PHAs met collectively with the Minister of Sport, Culture and Heritage to discuss the state of heritage in Manitoba and our desperate need to increase funding to the sector on all fronts. Uh, we showed him the charts, the numbers, and we proposed an endowment fund that would enable multi-year funding for each PHA. It would allow us to plan for the future, for large long-term projects. It would reduce the time and energy wasted on grant requests and justification reports, as well as attrition and burnout. It would also make our funding independent of the minister or government in power. Unfortunately, the PHA's collective letters and meetings over the years with the ever rotating heritage ministers have left us with nothing but well meant but unkept promises. And despite having more demanded of us with less and less support every year, we have been going above and beyond. We need the funds and we have shown that we deserve them. So I am going to end my presentation with a question. What does it mean to be a PHA? At this point, it seems like PHAs are able to apply for the same grant we were able to apply for last year. And the province gets to put their logo and brand in our work. So where is the benefit in being a PHA? 
It doesn't guarantee us funding or any other kind of support. So what does it mean to be a Manitoba Provincial Heritage Agency? And if the heritage minister were here, I would have asked him to answer that question. That's it for me today. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Alicia. We've been listening very carefully and thanks for your presentation. I noticed that Thomas is now with us and I've, as I've mentioned earlier, we'll have three presentations and then we'll be open for questions and answers. So our second speaker will be Thomas McLeod, who's the executive director of the Association of Manitoba Museums. He's originally from Alberta, but we welcome him to Manitoba. He's a graduate of the University of Calgary. He's served on a number of community heritage, arts, and arts organization boards, including Seven Oaks House Museum, the Millennium Center, Armstrong's, Associ Armstrong's Point Association, and the Nickel Art Museum. He's a former director of Dalnavert. And Thomas, it's over to you. Thank you so much, Michelle. Uh, thumbs up if you can hear me. I'm assuming I've got great contact. I am joining you today from Treaty 2 territory, uh, and it's my pleasure to uh, join the Manitoba Heritage Summit. And I thank all those who have taken time today to participate uh, in the summit. Uh, it's quite an honor to be part of the first panel and the kickoff. Uh, I wish that the news was better uh, and that there was more good news uh, in the heritage sector. Uh, generally, I try to look at the positive of things, but I think uh, we can agree uh, from Alicia's presentation that there are sectors in the heritage community that are desperately hanging on and uh, it's unsustainable, their current um, mode of operation. And I think that's something we need to be acutely aware of as we look at the challenges going forward in the future. I'm going to start off by uh, telling you a little bit about the Association of Manitoba Museums and the role that we play as a provincial heritage agency. And then I'm going to talk a little bit more uh, about our experience on workable solutions that we've seen in the past. Uh, so the Association of Manitoba Museums, it was founded in 1972. So this year we are celebrating our 50th anniversary year. Uh, next week, we will return to our annual in-person conference, and it's being held at the Royal Canadian Aviation Museum uh, in their brand new facility at the airport. And that will be on Friday, October 21st. And people can register for that conference using TOBA tickets if they still want to become involved. We're very excited about that, uh, to be back in person and celebrating our 50th year. Uh, the association represents about 200 museums across the province of Manitoba. Most of these museums are in rural communities. There is an average of two to three museums in each provincial riding. Uh, the primary mission of the Association of Manitoba Museums is to assist museums to be the best stewards of Manitoba's heritage and culture they can be. To that end, we offer professional development opportunities and advisory services and advocacy on behalf of the provincial museums and cooperation with our national affiliates. Our certificate training program in museum practice uh, has been operating since 1991. We have been updating it uh, to online delivery and the courses offered are offered on a cost recovery basis and are intended for volunteers, staff and board members working with Manitoba museums. Demand for our training programs remains high and our current course, which just opened uh, uh, last week uh, in exhibit design was oversubscribed. The AMM also works to offer specialized training courses in cooperation with the Canadian Conservation Institute and the Canadian Heritage Network, uh, both uh, strong federal bodies in the museum community. Uh, it's important to recognize that the museums that we represent, uh, people think about museums as being funded like libraries. They just get community funding and that's allocated and they get it year after year because they're such a valuable resource. Unfortunately, the museums in the province of Manitoba do not have uh, guaranteed funding. They are not tied to the municipal property taxes the way that libraries are. Their funding comes at the 
uh, at the generosity of the province in each budget year. And the budget, uh, the province has clearly struggled to maintain heritage funding. Uh, and basically the message over the last few years has come, we will hold the line on budget funding, but we're not in a position to increase it. Uh, uh, and except for this new government, this new government has made some very interesting moves uh, to support heritage. And I'll refer back to those. But the existing standard for the PHAs and for community museums still remains fixed funding that has not changed in the last 20 years. And that funding application has to be submitted year after year. Uh, and there's no guarantee that you'll get it in the next year. You will wait several months uh, to see if your funding will come in place. And so your hands are tied in terms of initiating projects until their funding is either approved or denied. And so it really does put a stranglehold on the industry. I'm going to attempt to share my screen here, if I can, and a moment. Uh, this gives a snapshot of the Manitoba Museum community, uh, and it's based on federal and provincial figures, uh, and is from the 2015-2016 uh, year. Uh, I'm hoping people can see it. And you'll see uh, that volunteers outnumber paid staff in across the province uh, by, uh, you know, about eight to one. And in a rural community, that ratio goes up to 20 to one. Uh, so the just like the uh, archaeological society, the backbone of delivering heritage and heritage programming and heritage experiences is on community volunteers. And that's been a great resource. And part of what I take great pride in the Association of Manitoba Museums is that our members are so active and that we are largely volunteer based with strong community commitments. Uh, but one has to recognize that that is a generous gift to the province of time, attention and skill sets that people are putting forward. And I think the province has an obligation to help ensure that these people's hours and commitments are supported over the long term through stability of funding. I don't think that's asking too much when people are giving so much of their time. Uh, you know, the number of visits here uh, in person visits uh, were 1.3 million visits uh, just before COVID. Uh, that was up to one and a half million visits. And online visits uh, a number of years ago were only half a million, and now we're up to over a million of online visits for museums across the province. So you see museums have been very active and engaged in pivoting and engaging audiences across the province, even during the restrictions of COVID. And I find it very interesting that the province of Manitoba, when they started to loosen the restrictions of uh, of COVID, uh, they didn't open restaurants first, they didn't open bars first, they opened libraries and museums were on the front line of reopening for uh, uh, under the COVID restrictions in the province of Manitoba. So I do believe the province sees the value to the public of heritage and heritage institutions. Uh, it's just unfortunately that the funding models uh, don't fit the same priority uh, that they do give uh, to them in other ways. Uh, so we're hoping that this government uh, will be willing to show some interest in stabilizing the funding over uh, the province in the long term. I want to conclude on this uh, screenshot by just sharing, like I said, um, the bulk of our museums in the community are small community museums. They're the small museums that have budgets of under $100,000. $100,000 is set, that's what's considered a small museum nationally. Any museum that has less than $100,000. I know most community museums would be over the moon if they had anywhere near $100,000 in funding. Uh, usually their funding is substantially less, if not uh, you know, a third of that amount, if they're lucky. Uh, but at the same time, 
they generate $2.7 million in revenues just from the small community museums uh, each year. And they do that with only eight full-time full staff working in rural communities. The bulk of staff uh, are either seasonal or student employment uh, contracts in seasonal communities. And as I said, usually for every staff person in a rural community, there are 20 volunteers that are making that museum operate on average. And so, you know, small museums have been doing the bulk of the work in across the province in every constituency in every community they have nine percent of the visitors 41 percent of the school tours 11 percent of our artifacts in the province and do 24 percent of the research requests yet they do this with only four percent of the full pay time staff in the province and they receive only five percent of the provincial funding for museums each year so you can see that, you know, the larger institutions, the uh, greater museums and larger urban areas do take up, a, you know, a fair bit of the provincial funding. But provincial museums and museums across the province and particularly the small community ones have been, like the Ar uh, uh, Archaeological Society, largely underfunded and expected to make do with just a few thousand dollars each year. And that's what they get by with. Uh, year after year with no stability. And so this is of great concern uh, to myself and our association members. Uh, and it, we've discovered it's a common theme across the heritage sector, unfortunately. Yeah, I guess that should pause sharing here. I don't know, it seems to be taking a mile, but I'm going to just go forward and let the computer do what it wants. <laughs> there we are. Uh, the uh, Since 2004, the Association of Manitoba Museums has assumed administering uh, conservation support services on behalf of the province of Manitoba. And this is part of our funding commitment that we get from the province each year. And it's dedicated to our cultural stewardship program. Uh, we provide access to a professional conservator and this is a key resource for small community museums that are engaged, seeking to engage in preventative conservation of their artifacts or care of their collections. Uh, and we're very proud to be doing this work and the fact that we do it uh, at a price point that is far less than what the province was delivering it for. Uh, we're very proud that we're able to pull off this work. Uh, recently, the Association of Manitoba Museums has been developing a shared database of collection records uh, for community museums uh, at an affordable price. Uh, currently, we have 14 community museums that have joined the Musitoba platform, and this year we're in the process of developing a public access web portal to this platform. We anticipate that once the web portal goes live, uh, probably in the new year, uh, by March, uh, then we will likely have demand from a number of other rural community museums that will want to begin to join and share their, their collections remotely uh, through this shared uh, collections uh, records uh, platform. And that's very exciting and innovative work. And this is possible through grant funding that we've been able to secure, some from the province, a large part federally, as well as from uh, other granting bodies such as the Winnipeg Foundation uh, and uh, the Arts Council of Manitoba have been very generous in supporting this project, as well as some additional funding for digital support uh, as we came out of COVID. So we're very thrilled to be bringing these forward. and. My point is, is that the local provincial associations have been working collectively to meet the needs of the heritage community and to address what our public and audiences expect of us. And we have been doing this with our funding literally being frozen for 20 years. And so I think that there should be a recognition of the amount of work and commitment that these professional uh, organizations have been doing to support the heritage community. And we really are hoping that the province will come round as well as the public will 
engage the province and say, you know, uh, we're looking at an election year coming up in the near future. And I'm hoping that when you are speaking with your provincial representatives, that you'll ask them, well, what have you been doing for sport, culture and heritage? And what are you doing specifically to support heritage for the long term and for those institutions that are struggling year after year? Uh, you know, there are uh, examples of this province having taken some very bold and innovative moves that I think could be duplicated for the provincial heritage sector. In 2020, the province of Manitoba created the Signature Museum Stability Fund for $10 million. This fund is endowed with uh, created a, a endowments held at uh, Endow Manitoba and the Winnipeg Foundation and generates $62,000 in funding for each of the seven signature museums. So that $10 million one-time investment is going to secure funding for seven feature museums, seven signature museums, largely rural-based in Manitoba for the next generation. And that's an amazing investment and really took, uh, really shows leadership on the part of the Heritage Department that they did say, okay, there's something that we can do here. And they've made a huge difference to a number of rural community museums, such as the Canadian Fossil Discovery Centre, the Commonwealth Air Training Facility, uh, and the uh, Icelandic Museum, as well as other uh, that make up the Signature Museum group. But that's just a start. You know, that's seven museums that have been helped out, you know, but there's 200 community museums across the province that are scrimping by on just barely whatever it, what it takes to keep the lights on and the heat on. And that's not a sustainable model. And uh, you will see probably again in this presentation, and Alicia brought it forward, how we compare to our neighboring province in Saskatchewan. And Saskatchewan has taken the, took several years ago, the very bold move of securing funding for heritage within its lotteries program. And so each year that the lotteries program is run, it generates revenue and that revenue is dedicated for our, a portion of it is dedicated for arts, culture and heritage. And that arts, culture and heritage portion provides security and long-term stability for the heritage sector in across the province of Saskatchewan. And so they've grown year over year, leaps and bounds ahead of us here in Manitoba, just through good planning. And so the same good planning that the, muse that the province showed in developing the Signature Museum program, I think if they also looked at additional endowment programs or opportunities to secure funding for the long term for the heritage sector would have a huge difference for another generation. Now, why is this so important? You know, uh, heritage isn't a luxury. It is our community's culture. It's our collective being, and it's a living thing. Uh, over the next 20 years, Canada's population will become increasingly diverse. And by 2036, immigrants will represent between 25 and 30 percent of Canada's population. And that won't be just, that will be largely in urban areas, but it will also be in the rural communities. So the face of our communities are changing and museums and archives are changing with them to share the stories and share the information that is relevant to these emerging communities. Another big force that has impacted the heritage sector in a very positive way is the growth of Indigenous communities beginning to take ownership of their own histories, their own archives, their own uh, artifacts. And that's really exciting. And provincial museums have a huge task in front of them in terms of helping Indigenous communities to repatriate materials and bring back the information that has been scattered across the globe <laughs> from many communities in our province. And we have to work very closely with these emerging uh, new museum participants as they begin to build their community stories and build their uh, histories to share uh, both within their own communities and to the wider public. This is a key aspect of reconciliation. 
and the Association of Manitoba Museums is very pleased and proud to be participating in these activities and planning, but we do recognize that it's all occurring without additional funding or without the necessary funding to really make it happen. And so the priorities are growing ever more uh, as we begin to modernize uh, how we reach our audiences, recognize the diversity of the Manitoba community as it's growing and changing and evolving and beginning to ensure that everyone's voice is reflected in their community and that no matter what background you come from, whether it's First Nations, whether it's a new immigrant or whether it's a settler family background, that your stories are reflected in your communities and are and that you're able to share your truths. And so the urgency of this summit and the message that I think you're going to hear over and over today is that there's huge opportunity right now for Manitoba to mold a new generation of heritage support. And that's something that I'm looking forward to. And I'm hoping that we can map a way forward that embraces the opportunities uh, that are on our doorstep by learning from our neighboring province, by learning the value of stability of funding, and that it takes more than just a one year project to reflect a community's heritage. We need to be there year after year after year to ensure that community storage stories and, and valuable community knowledge is not lost. I hope I'm still on time, Michelle. <laughs> I hope we're there. Thank you very much, Thomas, uh, for that presentation. We'll move right away to the third presenter and then we'll open it up for questions and comments. And I hope you're uh, storing away some uh, comments you'd like to make and some questions you'd like to ask of our presenters. Our third and last uh, presenter is Gordon Goldsboro, a member of the Biological Sciences of the Department of Biological Sciences at the University of Manitoba. He's an active member of the Manitoba Historical Society in many ways. He's a former president of the Manitoba Historical Society. He's its current head researcher, webmaster, and an editor of Prairie History Magazine. He's mapped thousands of historic sites around the province, and he has a weekly column on the weekend morning show of CBC Radio 1. He's written four books on Manitoba history, including Abandoned Manitoba in 2016 and More Abandoned Manitoba in 2018. The two of them were national bestsellers. Gordon, there is no point in trying to introduce you further. I think your work is well recognized, and it's a pleasure to introduce you to this session this morning. Well, thank you, Michelle, for that very kind invitation and introduction. Uh, I'd like to start by noting that I am, uh, although I am active with the Manitoba Historical Society, the things I'm going to say this morning are not directly pertinent to the Historical Society. Uh, in fact, I, what I'd like to do is to give more of a sort of a historical overview, a sort of an introspection of the state of heritage in Manitoba over the last 50 or so years. I'm just going to share my screen for a moment, if you just bear with me. Okay, we'll just wait for that picture to show. There we go. I always love this picture because uh, it, I, I found it on the course of my travels in rural Manitoba. I, I've always wondered why someone saw fit to put up a caution sign about an upcoming historical site. Anyway, uh, what I'd like to first start with is uh, sort of an overview of the role of the provincial government in the uh, promotion of history and heritage in Manitoba. And, and this, this list that I'm showing you right now basically summarizes the names of the department that had its mandate over the uh, heritage portfolio, essentially, uh, going back about 50 or so years. As you can see, back in 1969, it was called the Department of Cultural Affairs. Uh, the word culture was interpreted broadly. Uh, but in fact, if you look at the various names that it's held through the years, you see some recurring words. You see tourism, uh, you see recreation, uh, citizenship, tourism, sports. Heritage does appear. Uh, in fact, in, uh, in, it appeared overtly in 1981 uh, as the Department of Culture heritage and recreation. And it's varied a lot. Uh, you'll notice, for instance, that from 2013 to 2016, 
it disappeared altogether. Uh, the word heritage was not involved. It was the Department of Tourism, Culture, Sports, and Consumer Protection. I suppose the assumption being is that uh, it was included in the realm of culture. Uh, it did return in 2016, and then, of course, we are presently under the uh, Department of Sport, Culture, and Heritage. I'm not sure what priority one can draw from the order of those three, but it would appear that sport has acquired a much higher priority than in the past. Uh, heritage, well, it's the last. Now, within that department, the uh, the part, the branch that is primarily responsible for the government uh, heritage portfolio is the historic uh, resources branch, or at least I should say was the historic resources branch. It has been recently renamed. Uh, it was established in the 1970s to essentially coordinate the government's role in all facets of provincial history and heritage. And uh, it was to have public uh, input, a public sort of advice from a body called the Manitoba Heritage Council. I'll, I'll come back and talk about them in a few moments. This uh, historic resources branch, I think most would, would, would agree, uh, was especially active in the 1980s and 1990s. The reason for that I'll come back and talk about shortly. And the sorts of work that the branch did uh, were in at least six areas. Um, they did research uh, to collect original new knowledge about Manitoba's past. Uh, they conducted inventories. They would collect, for, for instance, information on what sorts of uh, railway stations were in Manitoba, how many Ukrainian Catholic churches, and so on. Uh, they commemorated, uh, putting up plaques of various kinds around the province. They played an important role in public advisory. So if a member of the public was curious about something or needed some help in, in restoring some structure, uh, they could assist. Uh, they, of course, also served as a government advisory. If there was some matter that required government uh, uh, involvement, uh, they would provide expert uh, advice for that uh, action. And then they would provide financial support for groups such as the provincial heritage agencies, as you have already heard from Alicia and from Thomas, uh, but also in the form of grants to the general public and to other bodies to do work relating to aspects of history and heritage. These are the things that they used to do. Uh, I would submit that they do not do all of these things today. Arguably, one could maintain that, in fact, it's primarily the last two that the Historic Resources Branch does today, uh, predominantly government advisory and financial support. Now, I said that they were most active in the 1980s and 1990s. I think what motivated a lot of that activity was a new act, uh, a new uh, act of provincial governance that, uh, that was called the Heritage Resources Act of 1986. It replaced a previous act called the Historic Sites and Objects Act from 1967. And in fact, that uh, 1967 a date will come back in just a few moments. There are five components five parts to this uh, Heritage Resources Act. Uh, and the first two pertain to uh, his historic sites. Uh, one was the designation of sites that were especially uh, noteworthy and uh, memorable. And part two was the protection of important sites. Now, the work then that the Historic Resources Branch was tied in large part to some to these two parts. And uh, one of the things that I think we have to consider then is how this new act of 1986 uh, affected the, uh, the staff composition, the staff complement of the Historic Resources Branch. Uh, this, by the way, these data I'm showing you right now were reconstructed. They're not readily available. It was a bit of a work to try to compile this. This comes from the provincial telephone directory, how many people were listed in it from the historic resources branch. And what you see from the beginnings of the 1970s, there was a rapid increase in the staff complement. They were doing a lot of work. Uh, it went from basically one person to a peak of about 26 people by the early 1990s, reflecting, say, all of this work that they were doing under the Heritage Resources Act. Uh, as you can see, however, they stagnated through the uh, late 1990s into the early uh, 2000s. Uh, say the peak most recently was 25. And then since that time, it has diminished. And I mean, I don't mean to fault the work that the people at the Historic Resources Branch do. They do the best they can with the resources they have. Clearly, they don't have the resources that they once had 
and therefore they can't do all of the work that I'm sure they would like to do. This is, I think, a reflection of the problem, or part of the problem, is the gradual erosion in capability uh, by the historic resources branch. Today, well, we don't know exactly what the complement is. Uh, the last entry I could find was nine people. Well, one of the manifestations of their work and the decline in their work is the designations then. So here are statistics on the designation of provincial historic sites. And as you can see from the early uh, 1940s, when the uh, Historic Sites and Advisory Board of Manitoba, I'll come back and mention them, them again in a few moments, when they became active, there was a few designations. There was really only one or two through the first few decades. But the Heritage Resources Act of 1986 really kicked the designation into high gear. You can see that it jumped up to the in their 30s range. It increased still further in the 1990s. That was really the golden age of designation. It dropped dramatically in the 2000s. And I regret to say that in the 2010s, uh, there was one. Uh, and it occurred in 2011, uh, 11 years ago. There have been none in so far in the 2020s. A third part of the Heritage Resources Act of 1986 uh, was the uh, designation of municipal uh, heritage sites, places that had local significance. They might not have been of provincial significance, but they were interesting or important from a local perspective. And, and so, for example, the Act made provision for something called municipal heritage committees, or what we now today call municipal heritage advisory committees, or MHACs. Now, these MHACs uh, essentially uh, can exist for each of the municipalities in Manitoba. There's over 100 municipalities, and each of those municipalities is encouraged to form an MHAC so as to advise the municipal council on potential historic sites that could be designated, uh, to recognize, to commemorate important themes, uh, events, people in the municipality that should be brought to people's attention, uh, to do an inventory of what local uh, sites there may be within the municipality of, of significance, uh, to assess the uh, resources that have particular value, whether it's historical value, archaeological value, or, or architectural value, and then where possible and where there's interest to undertake projects. These are all things that MHACs can do. Now, it begs the question of how many MHACs are there? Uh, I suspect the actual number on paper is far higher than the number that are active. I, I, I did a quick a calculation on based on my own experience, and it, it's about a half a dozen that are active of the over 100 municipalities that exist in Manitoba. So clearly, not all municipalities have seen MHACs as a priority. And in fact, in many cases, the provincial government does defer to municipalities when it comes to designation of sites. Uh, one of the rationales I've heard for the lack of designations provincially for the last 11 years is that municipalities are expected to sort of fill in the gap. Well, they're not. As you can see from this chart, again, the, the Heritage Resources Act of 1986 did stimulate the designation of municipally important sites through the 1980s, 1990s, and even a carryover into the 2000s. But there is a corresponding plummet in the 2010s and uh, the numbers that are occurring now, I, I rarely hear because there also isn't a mechanism to advertise these designations on a provincial scale. Uh, we don't really know how many there are, but there are many fewer than there have been in the past. So the net result is there aren't very many designations occurring at the provincial level. There also aren't very many happening at the municipal level. Uh, a fourth a component of the uh, of, of the Heritage Resources Act of 1986 was for the designation of what were called heritage objects, things that really didn't fall into any of the other categories. It was sort of a catch-all term if there was a particular resource that was seen as significant, but which simply didn't qualify as a as a historic site, for example, it could be considered a heritage object. Uh, it also included human remains. Uh, after 1967, when the uh, Heritage Resources Act replaced the preceding act of legislation, there was a change in the uh, control over human remains. Uh, previously, it had been the purview of the landowner on which these remains were found. Uh, as of the act of 1986, that 
turned to the crown, the control over human remains. And of course, what we're talking about here are remains that are not in any designated cemetery or burial grounds. Uh, it could, for example, include uh, graves on the sites of indigenous residential schools. Uh, it could consist of, of private family cemeteries. Those remains are the property of the provincial government. Uh, and therefore, uh, per persons who may own the property uh, are not at liberty to do as they choose with those with those remains. And this does have implications, one of which is that there's a lot of cemeteries that are not formally designated as such, especially in southern Manitoba, in the former Mennonite East and West Reserves uh, that enjoy no protection. And, and that is a problem. Uh, we've identified it as a, a concern. We would like to think that the Cemeteries Act will be amended so as to confer some degree of actual formal protection to those cemeteries. But coming back to the heritage objects, uh, one of the things that interested me was which objects had been designated. Uh, I had to do some digging to find out. Does anyone know? Well, it turns out there are two. There is the Skippy L, which is a derelict ship in the Paw. Uh, in fact, it's in rather rough shape. I got a photo sent to me just the other day. Uh, it's looking pretty bad. And there's actually been interest in potentially getting rid of the Skippy L. Uh, the other is the statue of Timothy Eaton in the uh, in the arena down, downtown, the one that everybody comes and rubs the toe of. He is an officially designated heritage object. The fifth and final component of the Heritage Resources Act of 1986 uh, is sort of general, anything that isn't covered by any of the preceding uh, parts. And this is the one that established the Manitoba Heritage Council that I mentioned earlier. Now, what is it? Well, its primary role is to serve as a public advisory body to the Historic Resources Branch. Uh, but it actually precedes the Historic Resources Branch by a number of years. Remember, the Historic Resources Branch was formed in the 1970s. The, uh, the pre precursor to the Heritage Council was the Historic Sites Advisory Board of Manitoba, founded in 1946. And primarily what it did was to uh, put up plaques. There are a number of them around the province. You've probably seen many of the uh, plaques. Uh, the earlier ones, for example, were six-sided, quite attractive. Uh, there's many of them still out on the landscape. Uh, and then subsequently sort of a rectangular plaque. And there's many of them out there uh, that were put up as a result of the work of the Manitoba Heritage Council. So uh, today uh, it, it approves commemorative uh, plaque text uh, it uh, meets uh, periodically, or at least it used to meet, uh, at the call of the Secretary of the Council, which was the Director of the Historic Resources Branch. But regretfully, it hasn't met uh, since 2016. It used to meet on at least twice a year. It has now not met for six years. Uh, this is maybe changing. Uh, the provincial government has requested that all agencies, boards, and commissions be re-examined to see if they are in fact serving a useful role. And as part of that evaluation, the, uh, the Historic Resources Branch's uh, role with the Manitoba Heritage Council is being looked at, and uh, it is possibly going to be reactivated. We don't yet fully know. If it is reactivated, I'm told that one of its main functions will be to re-evaluate existing plaque text for, among other things, cultural sensitivity, you know, because in the past we sometimes use language that we would choose not to use today, uh, and so that may be uh, involved replacement of some of the plaques that are out there on the landscape. Now, I want to come to talk about the provincial heritage agencies because uh, we've been hearing a little bit about them. They are, in fact, the hosts of today's Heritage Summit. Uh, there are eight of them that I'm listing here. I don't know if, if, any, if you knew all of them, so I thought I would at least enumerate them for you. Uh, there's the Association of Manitoba Archives that represents the various archives around the province. The Association of Manitoba Mus Museums, which of course is where uh, Thomas McLeod is the executive director uh, representing many of the museums around the province. Heritage Winnipeg, of course, uh, advocates on behalf of Winnipeg's built heritage. The Jewish Heritage Center of Western Canada uh, has a wonderful facility here in Winnipeg that uh, chronicles the Jewish experience in Western Canada. The Société Historique de Saint-Boniface the St. Boniface Historical Society, aspects of uh, Francophone her heritage and culture in Manitoba, the Manitoba Archaeological Society. And of course, you heard from Alicia Gooden, uh, its president on uh, its uh, current status. 
the Manitoba Genealogical Society, whose uh, offices uh, we are enjoying today, thanks to their, their uh, interest in the Heritage Summit. And then finally, my organization, the Manitoba Historical Society, the second oldest uh, heritage organization in all of Canada, uh, older, uh, younger only by one year than the one in Nova Scotia. Now, uh, Alicia Gooden asked the question, uh, what makes for a PHA? Well, one could well ask what makes for one today, but what I'll offer is the original definition of a PHA as it was deemed by the provincial government. No one is quite sure what led those eight PHAs to be chosen. Uh, no one really quite knows uh, the rationale on which they were selected or on which they were funded. And I'll come back to the funding in just a moment. But these are a list of the criteria for them. They were not-for-profit, charitable organizations, and they all are, whose mandate relates to the protection, interpretation, and promotion of Manitoba's heritage resources. Uh, they all as, uh, have an, a province-wide mandate and membership, uh, a history of demonstrated public service, and of course, as you've already been hearing, dramatic public service that often uh, dramatically exceeds uh, the, the amount of support, financial support they receive that don't duplicate existing programs, have a well-established fundraising function, and for which there is a demonstrated financial need. And I think the, uh, Alicia very eloquently uh, drew to the attention the last bullet especially. There is a demonstrated financial need uh, that far exceeds um, the uh, what we what receive. So uh, this is a summary of some of the numbers, some of which you have already seen. Uh, it also lists the paid staff. It's, it's worth noting that the vast majority of the work done by the PHAs is done by volunteers, unpaid volunteers. The vast majority of the work that each of them does is not paid financially. Uh, they have ranging from no paid staff to as many as five paid staff. But if you do a quick calculation based, for example, on the provincial funding to each of the PHAs, if you divide it by the uh, amount number of people, it is not a working wage. It's not a living wage. No one can live on the amount they get uh, if this was the sole source of funding. The money does range considerably, as you can see from this chart, from a low $11,200 to $75,900. And it is simply inadequate for the work that the PHAs do. So let me talk uh, now more, a little more specifically about the state of affairs. There was, as I mentioned before, the glory years of the 1980s, the 1990s, when much of the work in documenting, collecting information, presenting and sharing information was done by paid, trained professionals working for the provincial government, for the historic resources branch. I would submit that increasingly today, uh, much of the work is being done by unpaid untrained uh, volunteers. And I don't mean untrained in a pejorative sense. These are people who are often just as well informed as anyone with formal credentials. They do it because they love it. Uh, they work at PHAs, they work at museums, they work at archives, at MHACs, as individuals. They, there's many different ve venues by which they can be engaged. And we're seeing many of them involved in today's Heritage Summit. Uh, so the provincial, uh, the uh, Manitoba Historical Society, my organization, for example, provides a huge amount of public advisory service. On an average day, I get anywhere from 20 to 30 email asking my help with some project. I simply don't have the time both to answer them, much less to help them. Uh, we do research, we do inventory, and we do commemoration. A large amount of it that, frankly, used to be done by the provincial government. Alicia brought up the point, as did Thomas, about the comparison that can be made with counterpart organizations in our neighbor to the West. Uh, and it's a really a dramatic and striking comparison. If you look at any component of history heritage, whether it's archives, whether it's museums, archeology, span genealogy, history, or Francophone affairs, in all cases, the funding provided to the organizations in Saskatchewan dwarfs the amount that the, uh, the corresponding organizations get in Manitoba. It ranges anywhere from twice to as much as 23 times more funding in Saskatchewan. Now, does that mean that people in Saskatchewan are more 
fundamentally interested in history and heritage? I don't think so. I, I think there's just as much passion here in Manitoba. What it says, I think, is that the provincial government simply does not value the work that these PHAs are doing. That's fundamentally what it comes down to. The money tracks priority. Now, Alicia referred to this in passing, but I think it's worth showing you some of the evidence. Earlier this year, each of the PHAs received a, an email uh, requesting us to submit our uh, funding requirements for this year. As, as she pointed out, each year, the PHAs are required to submit a new application, which essentially means there is no continuity, there is no stability. Every year is a new story. Except when you look at it, there is no change permitted in any way in the funding. So this is a, an excerpt from the front page of that of the request for an application. Grant amount requested. And now the emphasis is mine. I, I, I shaded it in yellow so you can see it. It says in brackets, must be equal to last year's grant amount. Well, what that means is that an organization could be doing stellar work, absolutely amazing work, and the best you can hope to achieve is status quo. In other words, it's a recipe for stasis. It's a recipe for nothing to change. And it's a recipe for, frankly, organizations to get discouraged when the good works they're doing are not valued. Because as, as Michelle pointed out, the value of a dollar is eroding through inflation. A, a dollar 20 years ago is worth barely 67 cents today. And when funding from the provincial government does not change as this form shows, well, then in, in reality, the funding is getting smaller. So not only are we underfunded relative to our Saskatchewan counter counterparts, we're also underfunded compared to ourselves 20 years ago. So one could well ask, what are the future roles of all sorts of the players in the heritage sector? What are the roles of the PHAs as we struggle to provide the services that we have been providing? Many of us at personal cost. You heard some of the challenges, for example, that the Manitoba Archaeological Society is, is facing. The various constituent organizations within, for example, the Association of Manitoba Museums, the Association for Manitoba Archives, uh, their members, private citizens who toil uh, in preserving and promoting history and heritage, and as they get older, worry what's going to happen to some of their collections. The MHACs, as I said, there's barely a half a dozen that are active of the potentially over 100 that exist, what is their future role? The newly renamed Historic Resources Branch. As of 2021, it is now known as the Community Programs and Services Branch. Do you notice a change? The word heritage is gone. I would submit that reflects a change in its priorities. And then, of course, ultimately, what is the role of the provincial government in terms of the Manitoba Heritage Council? Is it going to be reactivated and made a functional part of the provincial role in the heritage or not? Is the Heritage Resources Act of 1986 going to be amended? It is now getting a little long in the tooth, and most legislations is revised on a periodic basis. Is it time to be reexamining that act to bring it up to the needs of present day? So I will conclude with a few slides on a call to action, because ultimately, that's the name of this session at the Heritage Summit, a call to action. I would submit that the provincial government's support for heritage is, first, small compared to other jurisdictions, notably our neighbors to the west in Saskatchewan. It is declining in relative purchasing power simply through the act of inflation while the actual dollars do not change. And third, unstable, because every year the PHAs must apply and reapply and submit interim uh, reports on our progress, all to get less money. And this creates uh, confusion, it creates a despondency. You know, people can't keep doing the work they do without a meaningful infusion of resources. And we would submit financial resources are a major part of that. Uh, of course, it isn't simply money. 
Uh, if it were, it might be an easily solved uh, problem, uh, but it's also, it's bigger than that because it involves human resources as well. The PHAs, as I've said before, are staffed almost exclusively by volunteers. They may have one or two or three or four, five uh, paid staff, but far less than they would need to undertake the vast numbers of services they provide. And of course, these themes that are coming out in today's summit are going to reflect some of these challenges. So for example, in terms of youth, we know that there are not many opportunities available for paid employment in the heritage sector. We see young people getting degrees and then having to go work in areas outside of their training or outside of Manitoba simply because they can't find work here. There need to be emphasis on providing paid employment for young people in the heritage sector. Diversity. Of course, we know that we must be reflective of Manitoba as a whole. Manitoba is a, is a vastly multicultural place. Uh, it's a wonderful place to live. And history and heritage must reflect that. Uh, indigenous reconciliation, of course, is a major component of that need for diversity. And then, of course, because uh, of Manitoba's geography, a, a vast majority of its population lives in or around Winnipeg and the capital region. Well, necessarily, this poses real geographic challenges for those who are working outside of the capital region. How do you work when you may or may not have critical mass? How do, where do you go to find help? with some of your problems. We've talked in the past at this summit about a heritage hub. It's still a great idea, but it's another one of the things that we simply cannot do without an infusion of resources. It simply cannot be another thing that we want to do top, added on top of everything else we do with fewer resources. So ultimately, in my view, and I, I know with many of my colleagues in the heritage sector, it really comes down to money, communication, and involvement. Uh, Alicia referred to the power of endowments. Endowment funds have been created by the provincial government. I commend the government for its interest in creating endowments as a permanent means to support entities that receive an endowment. The signature museums, the seven museums around Manitoba have all been now endowed with a permanent fund of money that ensures a certain amount of stability. And we would suggest that that's a wonderful model to follow for many of the other entities, the small community museums, the provincial heritage agencies and others. An endowment fund provides stable support. And we would encourage the government to consider that model for the PHAs. We, of course, are in an election year this year. The elections are going to be held in a few days. I would encourage you, uh, listening to this summit today, to engage with your elected representatives and for candidates for election on what do they perceive as the, uh, promote, as the challenge for heritage, uh, how do they intend to address those challenges, and how can they raise the, uh, the profile of, of provincial heritage? Ask this of your municipal candidates for the election coming up in a couple of weeks, but also keep in mind that next year, 2023, will be an election year in Manitoba, and the same questions could be posed to candidates for public office. So with that, I will conclude. Uh, I will thank you for your attention to my rant, and uh, I will turn it back to Michelle. Thank you very much, Gordon. That was a wide ranging rant and I thank you for it. I think it covers a lot of the areas we've been discussing as PHAs over the last few years. And it, I think, brings everyone up to date on where our thinking is. Uh, I'm going to open it up right away to questions. If there are any questions or comments, uh, would anybody like to uh, jump in and make a comment or ask a question? I'm not hearing too much, uh, a bit louder, please. I'm not hearing anything. So while you get your thoughts together, I should have mentioned uh, right at the beginning that I, am th that I am the chair of one of the PHAs, the Société Historique de Saint-Boniface, the Saint-Boniface Historical Society, founded in 1902. And if you've noticed that we get a bit more money than other PHAs, there's a reason for that. And I've been told by the department itself 
that in 1998, when we built a, an archive center, a three-story archive center, uh, there was no way for the government or the department at least to fund the, the um, maintenance of that center. So what they decided to do was to provide annual grants for which we have to apply every year and for which we have to do the work. Uh, we just can't take the money we receive and say, okay, we'll use this to keep the, to keep the lights on and the heat on. Uh, we have to do the work involved in, a, um, in the projects that we submit year after year. So that's why that number is there. And I thought I would just clarify that. Are there any questions or comments? Michel, um, oui. on, a des, on a des questions dans le calvardage in the chat. We see some questions. Um, so Shelly Sweeney is asking, shouldn't we have a land acknowledgement? Shelly, I'm getting to that right away in the break. Don't worry, we got a plan for that. But we also have uh, Michel Pichet who is asking, in what specific uh, areas is funding needed to expedite re repatriation? La repatri repatriation. Um, uh, but Michelle, we don't know who you're asking that question to. Alicia seems to be the better choice. I, I threw a quick typed answer there. Um, that would fall under the responsibility of the former HRB. Um, and I know they are working with, uh, PhD students at U of M. They're working with the University of Manitoba, um, and a few, and the Brandon University uh, staff and students. Um, they've been conducting ground penetrating radar jobs uh, and surveys, repatriation itself regarding, <sighs> regarding indigenous remains is a tricky topic because what you actually have to do is go to the closest indigenous community or who you think is, is most connected to those remains. and they decide what happens with them. But on the government end of things, it is HRB that would be involved. And I think they are down to three, four, five people. Like we said, 20 years ago, they had 25 staff member. They can barely get the dailies done, let alone projects as huge as repatriation. Uh, Rob, Rob, do you see any other questions that you might uh, pass on to all of us? No, I, I don't. Yeah. Yeah. Shelly oh, Shelly has a question right there. Does, does any government official ever have an answer to why the grants have to be applied for every year? Which I think is a, a general question we all ask ourselves. Anybody know any of our panelists might have any uh, insight on that? Well, if the minister graced us with his presence, he may have been able to answer that. Yeah, that's why we had hoped that the uh, we had hoped that the minister would appear. We've been inviting him since uh, the month of June, uh, so we're not too clear as to what these ministerial responsibilities are that suddenly showed up uh, for today. And that is a bit, uh, I'll say it very bluntly, that is disappointing. I wish the minister were here to answer these questions. Uh, all we can tell is that. The department does the same thing this year as it did last year as it did the year before and on it goes for the past 20 years. Um, that's something we can observe as a fact. Uh, why that is, is really for the government to answer. Well, on top of that, Michelle, uh, this year there was an additional component added to the funding from the provincial government for an interim report that uh, required extensive numbers to be compiled I know in, in the case of the Manitoba Historical Society, we would have to spend probably about a week compiling the statistics that they're asking for the, in the interim report. You know, so it's simply adding more bureaucracy on top of what we're already trying to do. You know, my view is that try to, you know, is to minimize the bureaucracy, give us the money, let us do the good work that Manitobans want us to do and just get out of the way. But unfortunately, the government seems to insist that it has to insert itself frequently in the decision about funding. And they say it isn't just annual anymore, it's now biannual within the year, they want two reports on what we're up to spending their money. I might add also, they, we used to get 100% of our funding right off the bat, and they've now changed it to 90% funding plus the interim report, and then you get the last 10%. So not only are they giving us more reports and justification requirements, mm -hmm. They're slapping it on us at, in the middle of the year or near the end of the year, but when before we're done our work for the year, 
Um, but they're also clawing back money. So the very little money that we do get, now we don't even get all of it at once. That's a very strange tendency, Alicia, if I might, if I might say so, because most of us report to members. We, have, we are membership-based, most of us. We report to our members. We report to any funder. We have publicly available reports on our activities. We have publicly available audited financial reports that are presented every year to our members. There is, and we present the same reports to the government. There is no reason to have even more reporting required simply because we are accountable first to our members and secondly to the funders. That's already being done. To have another layer of reporting is just beyond me. Uh, and again, it just eats up resources that are already very scarce. Any other comments or uh, uh, issues that you'd like to raise? Did you? We're going to get Gordon here to come and answer one because yeah, there's uh, there's been several questions posed in the Q and A, and uh, so one person is is noting, for example, about maybe we should give some of our presentations at the AMM conference, the Association of Manitoba Municipalities, the other AMM, uh, to uh, raise awareness among councillors, reeves, and mayors. And I think that's a wonderful idea because uh, you know the, where the rubber hits the road is at the local level. The local councillors and mayors and reeves, they're the ones that actually do a lot of the work on the landscape. So I think that's a wonderful suggestion. Um, they, uh, another person is pointing out that the chart showing Manitoba funding in comparison to Saskatchewan funding uh, for the fields of interest needs to be distributed to every media outlet in the province. Are there journalists out there who would take up the cause and keep this topic in front of MLAs and the legislature? Another very good point. Uh, we have been trying, um, uh, Michelle and I penned a letter that we sent to the Winnipeg Free Press hoping they would uh, publish it in their think tank section on the uh, editorial page. Uh, it was sent to them some time ago and uh, they, Free Press has not seen fit to publish it. So we don't know whether that in fact is because they don't really want to talk about it or whether because they're just inundated with other ones and just, we just have to wait our turn, we don't know. Uh, somebody's asking, has anyone approached the policy analysts at Manitoba Gaming, Liquor and Lotteries to ask for funds to possibly be allocated or dedicated to heritage groups? That would be a question to pose to your elected representative. That's not within the purview of the PHAs. Uh, we get the money we get from the provincial government. They choose where the money comes from. Uh, if they wanted to allocate it out of the uh, gaming revenue, out of the liquor and lotteries and cannabis revenue, I would assume they could because that's what they do in Saskatchewan. But uh, but that's not a decision we have any control over. Uh, uh, has an interesting point to that is that the Minister for Sport, Culture and Heritage is also the Minister for Liquor Lotteries. Uh, somebody's asking, has AMM, which I assume is the Association of Manitoba Museums, although there are two AMMs, ever undertaken a communication slash public awareness campaign with regard to their organization and all the work they do? I guess that's for you, Thomas. Yes, uh, we do. Uh, and we're actually involved in a national one. Uh, we have been working uh, both uh, to develop a, a regional toolkit for community museums to better advocate uh, for what they do and the value of what they do. And so we have uh, the first phase of that was entitled Reconsidering Museums. Uh, where we looked at, uh, where we surveyed the public and looked at where the museum was going, museum industry was going. And uh, the second phase of that, the toolkit and the public the advocacy toolkit, we're actually releasing at our conference next, uh, next week, uh, the stage on that. And so we partnered with uh, provincial uh, museum associations across the country on this task, because it is a shared issue. It's not just in Manitoba, where the museum community and the heritage community is largely undervalued. It's across the whole country. So we have been beating up on the province quite a bit, but to give them their, uh, to, but it is an issue across the entire nation, not just in Manitoba. Hmm. Another one of the comments in the q and said, I noticed that one candidate for mayor, I assume of Winnipeg, has says that a renewed city archives can be accommodated within his projected debt limits. Has heritage issues been addressed by any other candidates for mayor? I can uh, perhaps reply to that partially, uh, Gordon. 
uh, since I've been involved with this, the Association for Manitoba Archives for three or four years now, working on uh, getting our city archives in a decent place uh, rather than in the shed where they are exposed to destruction over the next few years, uh, unless we have a decent facility. Uh, the AMA, uh, if there's anybody here from the AMA, please jump in. Uh, it, to my knowledge, the AMA has been approaching all candidates for mayor. Some have replied privately, and I think uh, the uh, person asking this question is right in saying there is one who has publicly supported a new archive center for the city of Winnipeg archives. Uh, others have committed to, in private, uh, and I'll leave it to them to raise the question publicly. I think it would be useful for them to do so at this stage. Uh, and, and it would be useful also for this election to lead people to discuss what should happen to the city archives, which have been languishing in a, an inadequate shed since 2013. Is anybody from the AME here who could speak to this issue? Unless they're already uh, as a panelist, I'm not sure they can activate their voice. They, they can. You can post a question in the Q&A and then we, we can raise it here. Someone is saying, if there's no government member here today, and I think that's the case, when is the next opportunity we can gather heritage folks and go to them? Uh, and I would point out simply, we have asked for meetings and have not been granted meetings. So, uh, yeah, I'm not sure how we do that. But, and does anybody else want to weigh in on this question? I think I'll just add, Gordon, that we have been writing to the minister saying that uh, regardless of the answers we have received or not received from the department, uh, we are ready and prepared to work with the department at any time on this issue of funding for the PHAs, and we remain open to having discussions with the department on ways in which they might support uh, heritage work in Manitoba. Uh, we've certainly made our, our case. We've certainly tried to indicate we're ready to work with the government. Uh, we're waiting for the government to respond. It uh, looks like uh, Shelley Sweeney has her hand up and would like to speak. Uh, Shelley, uh, we'll, just, we'll just unmute you and you can, uh, you can uh, say what you read your piece. Um, just to say that the Association of Manitoba Archives have been uh, lobbying individual candidates for uh, the mayor race and have also sent out um, a letter to our supporters to ask them to, um, you know, question candidates for uh, different writings about um, how they feel about the, the mm -hmm. sorry state of the city of Winnipeg archives being basically in a warehouse uh, in the industrial district. And um, some, some uh, candidates have responded. Um, a lot have just said, well, they're too busy right now, but this is an important issue. Uh, but the, the status uh, remains that um, after some uh, discussions and, uh, you know, uh, canvassing of the community, the, um, the city munis or the municipal administration and the, the council have decided that the archives will go back <clears throat> into the Carnegie Library. And so now what we're waiting for is funding. And we can't, the, they applied for federal funding and the federal uh, officials said, only if you secure funding at the municipal level. So candidates uh, for mayor, you know, uh, a little bit responsive, but generally I would say that, uh, um, you know, even in this critical issue that's so easy to pinpoint, so easy to address uh, with specifics, um, you still don't get a very uh, strong reaction from, from candidates. Yeah, Thank if, you very much, Shelley. Should if, I add, Shelley. if I might add a point to that very quickly, um, I, I think right after the municipal election will be the time to talk to the new mayor and the new council because the decision has been made to return to Carnegie, but it's unfunded. Uh, the funding will have to go into the 2023 budget process, and I think that's what we'll have to work on very hard uh, right after the municipal election to make sure that our funding for the archives is assured 
uh, at the city of Winnipeg. So an unfunded decision is very nice, but it's got to be funding. And without that, we can't expect the federal government to put money on the table, although there is money available. Uh, Helly Wilson has their hand up. Uh, we'll unmute right. you to let you say your piece. Sorry, I pressed the wrong button at the bottom here. I thought I was pressing the button for the chat line. I just want to tell you, everybody, find it very interesting what you're talking about. Thank you. Thank you. The uh, Manitoba Genealogical Society, Southeast Winnipeg chapter. Oh, nope, they've disappeared. Uh, hmm. Tom Naismith looks like he has his hand up. Tom, did you want to weigh in on this? Yes, uh, thank you very much, Gordon. Um, I'm scrambling a bit this morning. I'm actually in a coffee shop. I've had a family obligation that's taken me away from much of the session um, that you've been involved in. But I do want to um, uh, underscore what Michelle and Shelley are saying about the situation at the city archives. We've been working very hard to try to get the city to fund an appropriate or proper facility for the city archives. As you know, it's uh, it's not in a proper facility by any means right now. In fact, the records are uh, endangered, I would believe, I would say, um, uh, in addition to being in an obscure location and uh, difficult to use there. And hardly any uh, professional work can be done with them. They're simply stored in a basically a metal shed. They've been dumped there since 2013. Um, but just add to what Shelley and, and Michelle have said, uh, I, I would like to ask for your support of all of the people listening today, um, all of the associations that are involved for the City Archives campaign. Um, we are entering a crucial period in that uh, campaign when there will be a new council, um, there will be an opportunity to influence the budget process. We've made some progress, but we're not there yet by any means. We do need everybody's help. Um, and I, I think that it's important to note that Archives in, in general in the province hold an extremely important, massive amount of information that serves all of us, all of, in all the heritage sectors, all of our citizens are in various walks of life. And so it is crucial that we get behind um, the, uh, uh, the need for a proper facility for one of the largest archives in our province, uh, the city of Winnipeg Archives. And so we may be approaching you to uh, offer support for us and help in our lobbying in the near future. So thank you very much for this opportunity. Thomas, you have your hand up. I just wanted to underline what Tom brings up is so important uh, that really uh, the biggest action that people can do is ask questions, raise their voices and say, you know, I value this in my community. And I want to know how are you taking this as an elected official as a priority? We have to recognize elected officials have a lot of calls on demands for their attention. And they'll always pay attention to the people that are actually talking to them. And so if you're not willing to raise your voice, if you're not willing to ask the question, then they're going to be distracted by those who are. And so it's important that you take a few moments when you're meeting with candidates to ask the question uh, and, and express why you value heritage and ask them what are they going to do to ensure that the city's heritage or the community's heritage is uh, supported over the long term. It's really important. There are still a few points that have been raised in the Q&A, but we are also getting it to the end of our time that's been allocated. I'll just address one of them because I think it's an important point. Uh, somebody is noting that the NDP convention is starting today and they think it would be interesting to see how heritage related policy points are reflected in their resolutions and their priorities and what comes to the floor. What I would say in response is that I don't think the, ne the provincial neglect of heritage is ideological, that the erosion of support for the PHAs, for example, has occurred under both NDP and conservative governments. So I don't think it's necessarily related to just philosophical differences. I, I think it's just simply seen that heritage is a low priority as compared to other things that the government is, is called upon to do. Uh, but it would be interesting to see what the NDP may have to say, because of course, 
we will be coming into an election year next year. And if they make some declaration about their support for heritage, we'd like to make sure they carry through on their pledge if they, for example, are to be, if they were to be elected next year. On that, uh, Tom, uh, on that, thank you very much. I think that, uh, look, if there's anybody here attending the convention this weekend, by all means, raise your hand and speak up. It would be very much appreciated. As moderator of this panel, I think I have to bring it to a close, although we know that this discussion could go on for a long time. Uh, please take advantage of the fact that we are in election mode at the civic level right now. And don't forget that we are in election mode a year from now. Uh, please keep these questions in mind and address your concerns to uh, candidates who will be knocking on your door and looking for your support. I think it would be very helpful. And as uh, Gordon just mentioned, this isn't a partisan issue. Uh, we have seen the same trends where whoever has been in government at the provincial level. So I think it's a question, it's a heritage issue and not a partisan issue in my view. With that, I want to thank our panelists, Alicia, Thomas and Gordon. I want to thank all of you for participating and staying with us till now. And I should maybe turn this all over to our uh, MC. Rob, over to you. Merci beaucoup, Michel. Whew. Okay, everybody. Let's take a deep breath, eh? All right. Finding balance in all of this is not an obvious thing, eh? C'est évident. There's been a lot of good discussion. There's been a lot of good ideas that have been passed on. Now it's time to, to think about these things and maybe maybe things will find a new balance. Mais pour le moment, I think it's time to take a break. Eh? We're going to take a short break. So about a, a, a five minute break, five, 10 minute break. Now I'm going to give you a little bit of homework when you're on your break, right? Because when we come back, we're going to be talking about land acknowledgement. Um, I have a little exercise I want to do with you. Um, so I want you to just think about how you do your land acknowledgements in your sites or in your everyday work. Um, I, I want you to think about that. Um, and when we come back, we'll talk about it. So five, five minutes, let's say five minutes, 10 minutes. We'll do 10 minutes. So take a coffee break, go to the washroom. Um, We'll see you in 10. A bientôt.